Hi there, welcome to this week's Pascal's China Lens. We're going to talk about when China will reopen. A question that many people in the business world, but also students, have on their mind. When can we go back to China? So I'm going to give you some context and my prediction on when I think it's going to happen. But before I do that, I want to actually talk about the question I raised at my previous video on China's main strengths, because a lot of people wrote in the comments what they believe China's main strength is. But the question I actually asked was, what's the title of my book? I wrote a new book and that new book has one title, has one word in there that is a strength of China that I believe is really important to talk about because I wrote a 400 page book just about that. And so lots of people wrote lots of things. So I want to share that. So I've put the list from, from 10, 10 comments, uh, people, 10, people, 10 people that said the same thing up to zero. And what you can see is that uh, culture is the number one. Most people believe on my channel that the main strength of China is their culture, but also that, that I would have written a book about culture. Uh, and then you see things like effective government, that was a number two, you see work, hard work ethic, and Chinese are really hard workers, the resilience of Chinese. This is all about the people, it's about the energy, it's about what people are doing, but it's also about the system. And so the question is, what did I write my book about? Now, it was not an easy answer, and maybe people say to hope, and that's because I, in the video, emphasized the fact that I believe hope is so important. Uh, unfortunately, the book is not about hope. Uh, I do write about hope in my book. I write about all these things on this list in my book. But the main topic I write about is not even in the top, top 10 list, but it, it is in the list. And the reason I write about it is because it's so important. It's so important because I believe that's the word that actually creates all the tensions we have today when it comes to China. And that word is trust. So my book is about trust. And I've been thinking for a whole year and been writing for a whole year about trust. And the question is, why do I want to write about trust? Well, the main reason is because I don't believe unless people start trusting China and Chinese more than they do today, anything we talk about about China is not going to have this effect. And whether it's innovation, whether it's technology, whether it's governance system, whether it's the, the business models or whatever we want to talk about, unless people start trusting China more, it's really hard. Now, why do I think this is important? It's because this is what I think is the topic of today. Now, there's three people on the channel that actually got it right. There's Maria, uh, there's Winningham, and there's somebody called Red Tomato. I guess that's not the real name, his real name or her real name. But I really want to thank you three uh, for guessing it right. And indeed, my book is about trust. And I thank you for your comments. Uh, you're all three going to get a free book from me. Uh, that's for sure. Just need to communicate with me on my channel. You can do that or on my website. And the reason I wrote about trust, and that's what they also say, is because this is very important inside China. And so the trust barometer is something that just came out from Edelman. And every year, Edelman gives a trust barometer. And this year, it's very clear that Chinese trust their government like 9 out of 10 people, 91%. While in the US, it's like 40% or 39%. And if you look at just uh, the Netherlands or Germany, countries like Belgium, where I'm, I live in, well, you see that just over the past year, from 22 to 2021, 20, it's actually gone down with 10 points or 12 points in Germany. Uh, US was down with three points. So people trust their government ever less, less and less. Well, we in, in, in Belgium actually have that distrust in our own government, then it's also logically, in my view, that we have a distrust in something that's far away and unknown and culturally and ideologically different like China. And that's why I wrote this book about trust. Now, the challenge with writing a book about trust is that how do you write a book about the real issue on trust and how Chinese trust Chinese and how Chinese trust the world and how Chinese look at trust knowing the fact that you're not really trusting the country or maybe not 100%. And so my aim and my audience for this book is really people, anyone who's kind of likes China or, or has questions about China or, or wants to know more about China, but has somewhere in the back of their mind, in the back of their head, 
some idea like, yeah, can we really trust China? And so I wanted to answer that question. So how do you do that? Because if you say, well, tr let's trust China as a title, then everybody would say, yeah, sure, I'm not going to be interested in reading that. So I had to think about a title. And so I took a title that is a little bit controversial, but that I hope many people will at least look at the cover, look at the back and try to understand what it's about. And that title is, Can We Trust China? Now, the question is, who's we? We can be anyone as long as you're interested in understanding more about how Chinese trust each other within their circles of trust and how they look at the world. And so this is actually just like my video channel, a Chinese lens on the world related to trust. I hope you will all like it. You can get the book in pre-sale on canwetrustchina.com very soon on pascalcoppins.com, but that's not important. What's important is that you actually believe and want to stay in dialogue with me in the comments on what you think, whether trust is actually the number key point for the world to understand China in order to understand the stories that China is telling to the world. Now, I'm going to continue with now with my video and this is all going to be about when China will reopen. Many people have been asking me recently, when is China going to reopen? People want to make plans for 2022 or maybe they should wait until 2023 to think about traveling to China, whether it's for business or for tourism. So I'll try and give you an answer what my prediction would be or expectation of when I think China would reopen. Now, if we look at the past two years and China has been almost closed up for two years now, the borders, it's almost in March, it will be two years. And Wuhan, that's where it all started, that got closed just two years ago, today almost. And so in 27th of January, 2020, Wuhan was closed and they were in complete lockdown and they went in lockdown for 77 days. Later on in March, it was all the borders closed for the rest of the world. And since then, China has had almost a zero tolerance policy. What it means is that as soon as there are certain infections happening in certain cities, that they will immediately put the city in lockdown. And we've seen this in many cities throughout China. And the most recent one, big one was in Xi'an, where 13 million people got put in lockdown for more than 10 days because there was like 200 or less than 200 infections. That's incredible. I mean, we have like 2000 or 20,000 in Belgium every single day now. But that was the policy and they've held that policy for two years now. And the problem with that is of course the quarantine. If you want to travel to China, if you're Chinese, it's a little bit easier. But if you're not Chinese and you have a business to do, I mean, you have a working permit, you still can go to China, but you have the quarantine. Two weeks, three weeks, depending on the situation, even athletes today for the Winter Olympics, they have to go into quarantine. And if they aren't vaccinated completely, it's three weeks of quarantine. I mean, this is pretty tough. But the reality is that China, because of this locking up the country for two years, has bought a lot of time. It means that China was able for two years to kept going and operate as if everything was normal, while the rest of the world for two years have been battling the pandemic more than anywhere else in, the, than anywhere else in China. Now, what happened is that this has created a huge challenge for China. And although we always say, yeah, China wants to lock up because they want to go back to being contained themselves and, and, and being on themselves, the reality is that this was very new for China as well. And so the main thing is that they had no blueprint. And although we often say China did crazy things and they're doing it because they want to be on their own, reality is that nobody knew how to deal with a pandemic like this. China had some knowledge from SARS. And so what they did is they created this blueprint for themselves. Most of the world didn't follow that blueprint, but later on had to follow some of the measures as well because they knew or figured out that was the only way to contain the virus in some fashion. Now, one of the big challenges China had, and not many people are talking about this for the past two years, is actually the fact 
that doing business in China is all about face-to-face. -face. It's about meeting people. And now suddenly keeping your distance, having to do Zoom calls or online calls, I mean, not being able to travel. This for a business country like China, where everything is about business very often, I mean, this is a huge challenge, much more than it is in many other countries that don't have this culture of having to meet face to face in order to actually trust each other. And so this was a huge disruption, but China did it. This was the challenge they coped with. Now, indirectly, the result of it is that they also got a lot of global attention and that wasn't very good attention. It was real anger from the rest of the world because of the virus that came out of Wuhan as, at first, but also because of the way that China communicated with the world, claiming they can know it better and they do it differently and they don't have to open up and they can do whatever they want in their way. And so the world got very upset. But also people living in China, the expats, foreigners living in China, they got really tired because many of them, and that was a huge challenge, were not able to travel for one or two years to their family overseas because every time they come back, they have to stay in quarantine. I mean, even for kids going to school, I mean, this is terrible because that is their social fabric or social connection that they need to keep to keep actually being active and happy in China as well. So what you saw is lots of foreigners starting to consider to move back to the US, to Europe and leave China because it's no fun to stay in an environment that is completely locked up and where you can't, you have your freedom within China, but basically you don't see the people that you actually care about. And then the thing is that China, because of this lockup, this lockdown of the whole country, the closing of the borders has not really created a hurt Immun immunity. I mean, in a way, it's, it's good because there's no virus or very little virus are going around in China, but it also means that people only can get immunity because of, due to the vaccine and not from natural getting the virus. I mean, it's a good and a bad thing because you don't want many people to die and get, of course, uh, the virus in itself. And maybe this is something that China as a choice made that they would not have this immunity. But the problem is, because of that, letting go of the zero tolerance policy is much more difficult for China than any other country because they have zero immunity. The only immunity they have is the vaccinations. And then the question is, how good are these vaccines for Omicron, for example? So that is really becoming the new normal of China. And China got used to be isolated and on their own, but it's not really fun. But at the same time, they feel like they, at least for two years, got to do their business as usual while the rest of the world was coping with the pandemic. So they actually gained two years on the rest of the world, but they also had to deal with all the challenges because of that. Now, the opportunity that was created because of it is, of course, the freedom. For two years, people could almost do whatever they wanted. I mean, specifically after Wuhan got out of their lockdowns again. I mean, most people were traveling. I mean, they were still cautious and, and keeping their distance. And of course, uh, you have to wash your hands and all the things that we did in the West. But they got freedom. They could travel wherever they go. Most of the times they could do business as normal almost. And so that is a huge difference with the West, where most countries anywhere in the world, they went from one wave to the other, from one lockdown to the other, from one measure to the other. I mean, I live in Belgium. I mean, we're going crazy about what is it now? What can we do? What can we not do? And so this is a big difference. Now, the other thing is because of this two years of closing the country, China's economy really blossomed. It continued to grow. I mean, for the first quarter, when they went in serious lockdown, it went down almost 7%. But then afterwards, the GDP started growing really in 2020. It was uh, almost uh, a little bit over 2%. 2021, we're talking about 8.1%. And some people will say in the media, yeah, but the last quarter, it's only at 4%. But yeah, they forget to compare that with the 6.4% of the quarter, the fourth quarter of 2020. And so on average, actually over those two years, China in that fourth quarter grew more than 5%. 
And the expectation for 2022 is that China will grow somewhere between 5 and 6%, probably 5.2, 5.3. I mean, there's very few economies that can do that. I mean, we will do it because we had no growth uh, just previous years or very little. And so growing fast now is just to recover from the, the downside we had before. But China kept up. And so this is a huge opportunity. In economic terms, you could say that China gained two years on the rest of the world. But the most important in my view, from the opportunity point of view, is that they created unity, solidarity. They were helping each other. They started feeling that they did a better job than the rest of the world. And the reason they did it is because they got along and they figured out if we collectively try to contain the virus by doing everything we can against it, have this zero tolerance policy and accept the fact that we have to go in strict lockdowns when needed, we are getting closer to each other. And so it's like the civilization of China of 2,500 years came awake because of the pandemic. And so that has never been stronger. And you see it in the trust levels very, very much. China today is at more than 90% of the people are trusting the government, are trusting what Chinese leaderships have done to contain the virus. And that compared with the US, which is at 39% trust in the government, is very clear that in China, people trust the government twice as much as they do in most countries in the West. And countries like Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, I mean, they went real down on the barometer of Edelman that does this every year, a trust barometer, reel down in trust in the government. And so this tells you something about the difference between China and the rest of the world, specifically the West, that has very, very little trust into the government, into the leadership. And that has something to do with the pandemic. And now the question is, how will China loosen up and open up again? And so I think 2000. 22 is a year where China is extremely hopeful because they feel they did a better job than anyone else. We can disagree or agree on that, but the reality is this is how many Chinese feel. And that's a good start of a new normal post-pandemic. Now, the other thing is that there's a lot of pressure lately to actually open up for China. And so that's why I think 2022, we're gonna see some real announcements. Why is that? I mean, we saw in Xi'an, there were some problems with people not getting food when there was lockdowns of 13 million people. And so we could really see that the Chinese people feel that it's about time to start reopening up because we can't deal with another strict lockdown and this zero tolerance policy is starting to become difficult for some of us. We wanna get back to normal. This is what you see. Now, compared with the rest of the world, I mean, there's no comparison. I mean, when we see specifically in Belgium and Brussels, every day there's, there's like manifestations and, 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 and revolution almost about the measures and that they want to stop. I mean, there's nothing compared to China. I mean, China, people are still very much willing to actually comply with all the measures and, and go, with, go through with it. But still you feel that there's a social unrest starting, very, very little. And then also from a business perspective, the big issue is cross-border trade. All the logistics that has to come inside China and outside China, I mean, they got stuck at the border. There's the customs that is holding everything, specifically frozen foods and stuff, other stuff like that. And so they have a problem in China that is delaying deliveries on both sides, in and out China. And that's not good for a country that is doing so well on exports. They've been growing exports crazily in 2021. And so China is still very much export dependent. And so that is a problem as well. And the world is starting to look for alternatives if the customs of China are going to keep that zero tolerance policy. Now, what you also see from an international point of view is that the world is back, simple. The world, they are starting to allow travel everywhere. The US, you can travel to the US. Within Europe, you can travel to most places. I mean, the world is starting to go back. And there's more and more barometers where they say, if the virus is, is at that stage, then you can do this and that and that, which means we're looking at a system to actually be able to have our lives 
living with the pandemic. And so we have started to come back. And that means that the rest of the world has now decided that it's time for this pandemic to end. I mean, the virus doesn't listen to the world, but reality is we're starting to accept that we have to live with this virus. And then, of course, what you see recently is that the zero tolerance policy countries or zero COVID countries like New Zealand and Australia, the islands mainly, um, that were locked up as well. They closed their border as well. Very strict closing. Well, they have started to open up as well. You see Singapore, you see Thailand, everybody's loosening up all their agreements and quarantine rules to get into the country. And so China somehow will be the last man standing to figure out when they will actually open up the borders. So I believe there's a real pressure and momentum building up internally and externally for China to start making decisions. I think China is back. The only question is when will they announce that they will be back and when will they actually start doing it? But I think mentally, I mean, just in their mind, China has already made up their mind. That's my view that 2022, that's the moment they need to get back on the world stage. Now, if you look at the statements to get an idea on what's happening, you can look at some of the top epidemiologists like uh, uh, Zhang Wenhong, the, the, the Anthony Fauci of, of, of China. And he clearly said in June last year already that once everybody, once there's herd immunity and that everybody's vaccinated in China and the rest of the world is starting to get vaccinated as well, specifically the Western world, I mean, they should open up. And so already almost eight months ago, there were signs, the first signs that China is starting to think about opening up. But then specifically in December, uh, Zhong Nangshan, uh, one of the top epidemiologists in, in China, he said that with the vaccination level that China had, and at that point it was about 75% of the population that was fully vaccinated. Now we're talking about 86% that is fully vaccinated, 90% that has a first vaccination of the whole population. I mean, this is, this is crazy. It, it's actually one of the top countries being vaccinated. We don't talk often about that. But he said that when everybody is vaccinated at 85%, which is today, then China should loosen up. He, he expected by December, January, that China could actually start slowly opening up certain things. Now, it doesn't happen that quickly uh, because there's other things happening. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the reality is that the virologists or the epidemiologists, they are saying it's kind of time to start thinking about opening up. And this is the interesting thing. In the West, most of the virologists, the epidemiologists, what they are saying is just the opposite. They're saying we should have more measures. We should actually do more lockdowns. We should actually be more careful. While in China, it's the politicians that say we should be very careful. And it's actually the virologists that say maybe it's time to open up. Very interesting to see the opposite direction of both of these experts. And then when you think about tourism, that's also interesting. The founder or the chairman of Ctrip, uh, the biggest uh, travel agency in China, number two in the world, Trip.com is, is more well known as a brand outside China. Uh, James Liang, what he said is that he expects China by this summer, 2022, to actually open up for tourism. He's saying the reason is simple. By March, May, April, most of the Asian countries will have opened up for tourism. And so you can expect like three, four months later that China will also open up because if Asia opens up, then it's really hard for China not to open up. I think he's a little optimistic, but it's a good sign that China wants to open up. And then if you look at the national, international news, uh, like Jefferies, what you see is that many, many people are talking about it's not going to happen in 2022. And most of my friends, foreign friends living in China or outside China say China is not going to up this year, open up this year. And specifically, they refer to the uh, National uh, Party Congress in November, where they say, yeah, I mean, before Xi Jinping gets his third term, China's not going to open up. I would disagree with that. I believe China will look at the data. China will look at the virus. They will look at what's happening outside China. And they also understand that this is hurting the economy in some fashion. They took an advantage for two years, but now it's time to get back. So I don't think that will be the case, but we'll see. 
Now, if you look at the data, I mean, what's very clear, if you look at project projections or forecasts about the, the COVID-19, what you see is that normally, let's hope that's the case, by May, end of May, the death rate of the virus of COVID-19 would go slowly to zero, meaning it's going to flatten that curve. And the other thing that we see often in the West as well is that the hospital admissions and the intention, uh, intensive care is really going with the waves, but that somewhere in May, unless there's a new wave coming up with a new variant, it should actually die as well. And so these are the two big things because people dying, that's really the main issue. That's what you don't want. People getting sick is not the big issue. It's because that's like with a flu. The problem is more if they die and the problem if they get really sick. And then you also have to take care of the hospitals from an admission point of view. And if you don't have enough beds or enough people that can care for those people, um, doctors and nurses, then you have another problem. And so those two things from a forecast point of view, unless there is another variant like a Delta that comes back, then it doesn't look that this will be a big problem. And then the vaccination level. I mean, in the Western countries, in China, we're all aiming at 50%, 60%, 70%. In Belgium, it's, it's more than 80%. Uh, so countries in Western Europe that are doing very well, they're getting this herd immunity, specifically against Delta. For Omicron, it's not so clear, but that's an interesting talk about Omicron because that started in South Africa. And when it started many, a few months ago, then everybody was talking about South Africa like, whoa, another variant, and this is gonna kill the world, and it's, it's gonna be the worst one of all. And the bad news from South Africa was something that we immediately distributed and told to everyone. Now, two months later in South Africa, it's really tampering down and, and the curve is flattening, is actually going to zero, specifically on people dying from Omicron. There's almost none. If you look at all the deaths in South Africa, there's like 300,000, that's a lot of people that died. Uh, but most of that, 50% is from Delta and Omicron is only 3%. And so when they told the whole world that actually much of this virus, Omicron, it's not making people die. It's, it's, it's actually making people sick, but they're not dying of it. It's going to become epidemic like a flu. Then the world didn't believe it. And so I think this is interesting because when countries like South Africa or China or countries that are far away and with different type of, of, of leadership, when they say that there's bad news, everybody believes it and sends, sends it everywhere throughout the media. When there's good news, people don't trust it. And so there's something to think about. Now, I believe that we are reaching a peak. Now, I'm no virologist, so I have no idea. So I, I'm basing my, this on, on other people's uh, data. But it looks like, let's hope for it, that by the end of May, maybe this Omicron is just going to become a normal flu. We're all going to get vaccinated, and, and specifically in West Europe, in America, North America, and hopefully very soon the rest of the world. And we start to reach that peak. Now, that will be the decision for China to decide how and when to open up. If that happens end of May, I think, I believe China will take that next step very quickly. Now, how are they going to reopen up is another question that people are asking. Well, I think they got like two years, at least one year of preparation time. You see it of the number of, of quarantine places and COVID hospitals that have been built. I mean, they've been building like crazy infrastructure capacity also for uh, nursing personnel and so on. And so this is something we haven't done in Belgium. And I've never really understood it. I mean, for two years, we had time to build capacity. For two years, we have had time to actually train nurses to help for COVID. But because we knew maybe that in two years it's going to end up, we decided not to do it. Why not build the capacity? Why not train medical staff? And if you don't use it, then you write it off. That would be the logical thing. This is how China thinks. This is not how a country where I live in, in Belgium thinks. But yeah, the politicians must have certain reason, I guess. Now, I think the, re the real challenge for China to reopen up will be social unrest. What it means is that so far China has been free and they've been in lockdown in certain places from certain times for a week or two weeks. And, and that's been unfortunate and not nice. And they had to do testing on millions of people at the time. And people don't like that. But at the same time, 
because they were free, it was kind of okay. Now the question is, if they open up and suddenly lots of people get sick and people die, I mean, how are they going to deal with that? So China will have to communicate very well to the population how they're going to open up. And only because of that, I believe they need at least three to six months to prepare for that communication towards their own population and figuring out how to structure it all. But they've had two years to prepare, so let's hope they've already done that part. Now, who's going to be able to access China's borders first? I mean, it's clearly going to be students, who have to study because China wants to attract foreign talent, but also foreign experts will be able to get into China. Of course, it's going to be business people specifically for the multinational companies uh, not having to do quarantine and then other business people. And the last on the list will probably be, be the tourists, people just wanting to visit China. Now, if James Liang from Trip says it's going to be summer for tourists, it would directly mean that business people and students would already be able to enter in Q2. Not sure. I think James is wrong for at least a quarter, but I don't know. We'll see. I mean, he has no more insights than I do. But it could also be an opportunity for China because for two years, they've actually taken a lead on the world because the world was busy with the pandemic and closed off much of its factories and its production while China, its factories were running double time, were going crazy. There was lots of opportunity. They've created a lot of innovation, which we don't talk about much anymore. But that opportunity, unless they start opening up, unless they do it in a good way and they do it fast, it's actually going to start having the opposite effect if they wait too long. And so they've taken that two years lead, but they could lose some of that if they wait too long to open up. And so I believe the rest of the world will start decoupling more from China if China doesn't open up. And so there's a real incentive to do it. And so I think they will very soon. I think it's very well planned. It's going to be very well planned. I mean, that's how you know China. They're going to say this, 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 this. Not everybody's going to be happy. It's going to be way too slow compared to what we did in the West, but at least it's going to be planned. And probably by 2023, tourism will be back and everything will be normal. Now, what we can also look at is the events of 2022 to understand when China would take that decision. I mean, clearly not in the first quarter that is now because of the Winter Olympics. I mean, they don't want to take any risk on the Winter Olympics when the whole world is watching China. At the same time, there's the National People's Congress in March. I mean, that's also such a big event and, and they don't want any bad publicity at that time as well. There's the Hong Kong elections. I mean, there's lots of things. So Q Q1, definitely no opening up. I don't even think they're going to have a statement, but they could do that in Q1. I think the statement of opening up will probably come in Q2. There's nothing really much important happening in Q2 when it comes to China. Most important one is the 16.1 countries, uh, plus one countries. This is like the East European and Central European countries that are, and the plus one is China. And it used to be uh, 17 plus one with Greece joining, but then uh, Lithuania actually left. And so it, right now it's 16.1 again. And this is important, but China has been losing some of its connection and soft power into the 16.1 uh, countries in Eastern and Central Europe. And so I'm not so sure opening up will be needed. Last year, did, Xi Jinping did a virtual summit as well. So there's no need to travel there. The G7, the NATO, I mean, China has nothing to do with that. So Q2 doesn't look like there's anything happening that needs to make a decision either to open up or not open up. So a good time for making a statement, I think. Q3 is important because in Q3, there's the Asian Games. We always talk about the Winter Olympics, but we forget that for China in September uh, this year, there's actually going to be the big Asian Games in Hangzhou, uh, where Alibaba is. And so this is a major event. So China could be waiting until after the Games, just like the Winter Games, to be sure and, and safe that actually uh, the Games will be able to happen clearly without any problems. Or they could ask anybody with a ticket for the game to actually open to actually come to China without any props. That's also possible. We don't know. But the games is important. Uh, the United Nations, the BRICS, uh, so Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, these countries, the emerging countries of the world, big summits happening. And I think Xi Jinping might want to go there. He might want to go to tell everybody China's back. We're back on that world stage. And if he travels, 
then basically he also needs to open the borders for anybody coming in China. Maybe not for everyone, but at least for business people and students and so on. So I think Q3 could actually be the opening up moment of China. That would be a positive thinking. Now, many people in the West say it's going to be Q4 or maybe 2023 because there's the National Party Congress, the Communist Party uh, National Congress, uh, and that for sure, it's where Xi Jinping will probably get his third term. Uh, and that means that there's such an importance, just like the one, the National People's Congress in March, that China will not open up until after that Congress. So that means we have to wait until no end of November, until December before China opens up. So logically it will be 2023. That's what many people say. There's also the Asian Games, uh, Asian uh, Summit, ASEAN, which is all most of the Asian countries, countries in Asia. There's the 50 years anniversary between Germany and China. There's the US midterms. I mean, there's a lot of things happening uh, at that point, the G20, the COP27. So there's a lot of things, summits in Q4. So my feeling personally is that I don't see why Xi Jinping would want to wait until after the National Party Congress. Because, I mean, he's going to be re-elected anyway. So what's the, what's the point? What's, what's, what's the issue? So I think that is actually a good moment, end of Q3, October, maybe after the October holidays, or in Q4, early Q4, to actually go and be on all these summits that are so important. So my guess is somewhere October, but I could be wrong. Now, is it going to be about PR or control? And you see in the media the two stories. Most people in international media are talking about, yes, yeah, it's about control. It's about making sure that they can just have that internal circulation happening and have the internal country be strong and they don't care about the world. And, and so right now, it's all about waiting for that National Party Congress. I disagree. I think it's going to be about PR. What it means is China and Xi Jinping and most of the leaders will want to use the opening up of China to actually show we're back on that stage. We're back. China's back. Simple. And so the first signs that you can see of this happening is that the land borders are starting to reopen. In December, you could see with Hong Kong that they've actually coordinated the health QR codes with China so that Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kongers could go and travel to China. That's the first land border. And so if they abide according to the same QL, uh, QR health code, they're part of the China uh, regulation and, and measures and they don't need to wait, go into quarantine. So that's the first sign. This is happening. You see also on economic side like Vietnam, the country said really they had to open up because there were lots of problems on the border. I mean, trucks were stuck the whole time because there was uh, an, an outbreak just across the border in China. And so China was very concerned, but they opened up Vietnam borders again, specifically for logistics and, tra and, 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 and uh, business, which means that when countries of economic uh, importance with China, and that are positive with China, actually ask China to open up more, China's actually accommodating, they're answering that request. So that tells me that China is going to start to reopen. But what's also interesting, if we look at last month in December, there's this five-year plan, the, the, the 14 to 50 five-year plan that was decided in, in March last year, is now being executed and there's more and more industries setting out their plans for the future. And when we look at the tourism industry, it's very clear just last month that they said, we want to open up now for inbound tourism. And we want to open up, and, and in Chinese, it's on the, on the Chinese uh, government site, it really says it's about the promotion of actions in a timely manner. Of course, we have to take care of, care of COVID and we have to see how it all goes with the data. But we want to do this because we have a big five-year plan for inbound tourism. We really want to introduce policies that support this tourism. We want to have multilingual tour guides. We, we really want to take the measures for high quality development of inbound tourism. This is what it says on the Chinese government site. And so from December on, China has changed that switch, shift, shifted that mindset to say, we now for the next five years, we need to focus on tourism, inbound and outbound. And that means the borders have to open up. Now, do they have to open up quickly? Maybe not. But if they wait another year, that five-year plan might be very difficult to achieve. And so I believe, personally, 
that China could reopen in Q3. It could be late Q3, it could be early Q4. Now, many people will say, don't expect China to open up before 2023. Maybe they will be right. This is just a personal opinion. I have no idea, nobody knows. I'm just looking at signs and I'd be interested to know what you think. The only thing I believe is that China is now starting to accommodate the wishes, look at the world around us and say, we've gotten two years of unfair advantage you could call it like that but now we need to go into doing business with the world again and be fair in everything as we had before in 2019 and so i believe china will look at the data they will look at what's happening with COVID 19. if there's no big new wave there's no big new variant that is happening and most of the western countries are getting vaccinated slowly i think they're going to start announcing the opening up but more importantly what do you think put it in the comments let me know do you think china will open up in 2022 if they do when do you think why do you think it let's discuss it and maybe you have insights i don't and i wish you all a, a good 2022 and hope that china will open up this year and see you next week for another pascal's china lens